Gus Newport, um, was a civil rights leader in the 1960s working alongside some of the folks whose names now adorn boulevards and community centers and parks and a lot of people whose names don't adorn boulevards and community centers and parks. You're like, if you're here, you likely already know the high points of Gus's resume. He was the two-time mayor of Berkeley, California in the 1980s. He was a lecturer at MIT, at Yale, at UC Santa Cruz. He was the director of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, which is the only nonprofit in the United States ever to be granted the right of eminent domain for affordable housing. He has served on the World Peace Council on multiple United Nations committees. I think arguably the only person in the room who can claim that as um, part of their he sits on the National Council of Elders, mentoring now a next generation of leadership into this struggle. This week he travels to Washington, D.C. to be awarded, uh, to receive the Arab American Institute's award for a lifetime of individual achievement. We've been connecting roughly weekly to frame up this conversation for the last couple of months. And I have been struck by the degree to which you have been, he has been committed to this struggle, to a life committed to peace, to justice, to the dignity of all people, and that that dignity is framed up as empowerment, that dignity is agency, that dignity is engagement, that dignity is, is in ownership. Um, like all of my heroes, uh, Gus has looked at a broken world, um, at a deeply inequitable world, um, at a severely imperfect world, and has never stepped back from the labor required to try and fix it. Um, and it is the commitment to that labor that is also married with an innate genius and an ingenuity for and a creativity for finding solutions and then being willing to put in the work to operationalize them um, that brings him to our stage tonight uh, and that I find uh, extremely um, inspiring. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Gus Newport. Good evening. I want to thank Matthew for that introduction, but I do get a little nervous with an introduction like that from time to time. <laughs> As he told you, I was vice president from the United States to the World Peace Council, whose headquarters was in Helsinki, Finland. And once I was invited to speak to the Finnish parliament, which is made up of both people from Finland and Sweden. In the head, before he introduced me, told a little story about years ago, he remembered somebody told him, whenever you're going to introduce somebody, don't take too long because you may overdo what's necessary. And as I heard Matthew going on, I said, oh my God, here we go. <laughs> I want to thank Cassie for taking us around the museum and showing us the history of what's been all about. And she took uh, myself and Jerry and Pam. Jerry is the reason that I'm here in Seattle. He invited me up five years ago to look at community development because of the work that I had done in Dudley Street because he was inviting up a young woman named Leah Mahan who's a filmmaker. And she made the film about Dudley Street called Holding Ground. And she told him, she said, well, wait a minute, if we're gonna talk about community development, I'm not coming unless Gus Newport comes. So that's how I got here five years ago. And I'm out here quite often with uh, Jerry's Thriving Communities and also the Association of Beloved Communities. Beloved communities mean so much to me because, as they say, I was in the civil rights movement. And beloved communities are what Martin Luther King called communities that work together, collectively, for the good of all people, irregardless of race, class, lifestyle, whatever. And until we get back to that, we're in a world of trouble. The politics of today leaves a lot desired, to be desired, as it always has. I mean, I tell people all the time, especially young people, History is not truly recorded in the United States of America. It's propaganda to make people think that the founding of this country was something so great that was to bring this great democracy. And as you see what's going on day after day, the kind of mental trauma 
the kinds of crime and stuff. It's all because we're now not giving that kind of a integrated approach to raise the quality of life for all. I mean, you know, Seattle is, technically speaking, a very great city. But it's said that Seattle has more cranes in the skies. I'm sorry to use that word today after that accident. More cranes in the sky than any city in the United States. Which means it can't really be pursuing community development through that public policy that is so necessary. Which means having data and analysis to look at what people of working class need in order to be able to live, you know, in whatever else. So when I was invited here by Matthew, and it was all about the arts, and I had to think, the arts informs the vision of the kind of society we'd like to see. Um, I was looking for something here that uh, was said by a friend of mine. He is also enjoined to conquer the great wilderness of himself. The precise role of the artist then is to eliminate that darkness, blaze roads through that vast force, so that we will not, in our doing, lose sight of its purpose, which is, after all, to make the world a more human dwelling place. That was James Baldwin. And I want you to know, in my fortunate days, James Baldwin held a chair at the University of California, Berkeley, when I was running for mayor the first time. And several of us, along with James Baldwin, used to sit up every night for four or five hours. And to hear the glory coming out of him, and that's what you got to understand about the arts. The thing about America, that our education system is such that we all practice individualism. And artists are at fault for that, too. They think their approach to art is the only thing that should happen and should be funded, rather than looking at the collective use of art to make sure that a society, a community is built. Look at what's happening in these United States of America right now. We teach young people to pass to the next grade. We teach them how to, to pass an exam. Critical thinking is a thing of the past. Sports and arts used to be a thing that happened in schools. I'm 84 years old in my days. When I was a kid in the second grade, I took piano lessons. I went on to take trumpet, tube, and string bass. They also taught everybody in grammar school tap dancing. And they taught us brush arts and this and that. They wiped that out in the school systems. So critical thinking is not there. We are 47th in the world right now in the literacy and education, these United States of America. I know it's hard for you to believe, but believe it. Dear old Cuba, which we propagandized so bad, has a 0.1% illiteracy rate because they put their money as poor as they are in health care and education. We've got to learn to think, brothers and sisters. I can't think of anything that I want more than a great future for the next generation. But how can a country that, char that, 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 that makes young people take out loans to get an education today? We're the only country in the world. I was a Martin Luther King fellow at MIT for two years. We had kids graduating from there with student loans of between $400,000 and $800,000. They, what does that mean? They graduate into slavery. And, the, and they can't really train for that which they want them because they got to find a job that's going to allow them to pay off this loan. And so let us think back. I got much of my knowledge about community development and planning from my grandmother. My grandmother and my mother. My grandmother, who grew up in Virginia, born in 1894, went to school late one day after picking cotton. She walks into the classroom late, and a white teacher slapped her without even asking a question. She walked out of school and never went back. But she became an avid reader. 
And they married very young in those days. In 17, she was married. She and her husband, when they went on their little honeymoon, they got stopped by the Ku Klux Klan and the police, took all their presents, put them in jail for two, two days. And so after that, her husband got wounded in a mine accident in West Virginia. She picked up my mother and her mother and took them to Pittsburgh where she had cousins and then moved to Rochester, New York, where I was raised. But with just a fourth grade education, my grandmother started taking me to see Paul Robeson and Marion Anderson when I was five years old into the Philharmonic all the time. My mother, who only went to the eighth grade, was head of the Parent Teachers Association for several years in a city like Rochester, New York. And I'm telling you this because I recognize every day how did these people have that kind of thinking? I have a picture of my grandmother on the right side of my wall in my bedroom, my mother at the end. So every night when I go to sleep, I see the two of them, and every night morning when I wake up, the spirit that raised me is there. But you know, I became the first one in my family to finish high school. My father only went to the 11th grade. He was another brain man, he was an avid reader. Now, I used to think he was a very mean man, but he just made me study, made me work hard. He didn't want me to play football because he was scared I was going to get injured. And he thought, being coming from the black family, I was going to have to take some kind of hard job someday to work. So he wanted to make sure that my health was OK. I went out for football in the 10th grade. My mother signed my papers. In the very first game, I scored the winning touchdown. It was in the paper. My father's friends were all saying, hey, you got a great son. And his car had been, uh, was in the shop. And when he got off the bus, a block from our house, my mother could tell by his, she said, oh my God, this man is pissed. So she told me, she said, now you take the back fence. I got some work to do. She got him straight. But then later on, when I got a scholarship, grant aid to go to Heidelberg University, he was pleased and got one of his white buddies to drive me to Ohio to go, and, and everything was all right. And I began to learn what a great man he was. But of course, growing up in Rochester, which is one of two cities that had two race riots in the 60s, I received a lot of police brutality. I mean, you know, as a very young age, young black men getting knocked off the corner by a policeman, whatever else, et cetera. So I go to college for a while, I drop out because I wasn't really ready to go. Get drafted in the military, signed to Heidelberg, Germany when the Berlin Wall was being built. And I say this because we have to integrate ourselves with each other to capture the stories of what history and society is to know the depths of what we got to do to show these people what we have to do. And if we look at today, what's happening right here in Seattle, where you have more cranes in the skies than any city in the country, which means that there's no planning really going on, developers underwrite 90% of all elected officials' campaigns. Let's face it, I got out of politics. I was drafted. Eight years was enough. If I'd have taken some of the things I was offered, my mother would have jumped out of the sky and come to put her <laughs> foot right in my butt. But so, I did eight years as the mayor of, Ber of, of, of Berkeley. We got a couple of big grants from HUD to build affordable senior housing. And I looked at doing a scattered site around the city in the hills and whatever. But the neoliberals said, no, you got to build it all in one place. And I said, what the hell is this? So I was invited to go to the University of Massachusetts at Boston to be the first senior fellow in the William Monroe Charter Institute. And I taught a class on alternative economics and public policy. And a group of people started coming to monitor my class from a place called Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Roxbury. And then they challenged me and said, we want you to come and spend your weekends with us. So I went to find out what was happening. And this was a community made up of 10% white, 20% Latino, 30% black, and another 20% or so Cape Verdean. From, but they had all come together collectively. They put together a board 
that said each group, irrespective of the numbers, should have four representatives on the board. All of our literature should be in the languages of every, that was all was spoke there, so that everybody could participate. We got translation equipment so at our meetings, everybody could participate because what we don't recognize, immigrants often bring very great ideas from their countries of building and development that we don't give them credit for, et cetera, whatever else. And then the head of redevelopment, a guy named Steve Coyle, who is an architecture and a lawyer, every night used to invite me out for a glass of wine. Now, you know, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that, but I, I, I wouldn't turn him down. <laughs> he made me aware of how a nonprofit organization could get eminent domain authority with a master plan that was accepted by the city. The only time it had ever been done before was with, believe it or not, Prudential Insurance, which must have been a nonprofit at one time. So we then began working with Tony Lee, who was from China, was head of the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, to gather the data to create GIS maps and everything else to educate community, developers, bankers, everybody on what was the cause of these communities going down. When I first got there, there was a whole lot of vacant lots strewn with all kinds of illegal debris because developers will go into poor communities and dump this kind of debris on these communities because they don't have the political clout. Well, what the people in Dudley Street first did, they put an initiative on the ballot to secede from Boston and name this area Mandela. And we found out that the city was taking all the CDBG money and spending it in upgraded areas that really didn't need the money. It wasn't going where it should have gone, so we exposed them. That ballot measure was defeated, but it so exposed the city that they said, well, let's work. So when Steve Cole said, well, if you all can get a master plan, we can give you eminent domain authority. And so we hired a couple people to translate the visions and the thoughts of community. What you must understand in low-income communities, 70 percent of heads of households are single women. And that goes back to post the Second World War when we went through an era of deindustrialization. And the corporations began sending all of our jobs to Europe and other places. And what did we replace those jobs with? Burger King and things like that. So the men were not making affordable wages to raise a family. And many of them got strung out on what we talk about today, opiates, drugs, etc., and they left. So women were working two or three jobs. But women are the greatest planners ever. They have a child, they birth a child, they know where the child care center should be, where schools should be, and all kinds of things. And if you include them in a planning process, you'd be amazed at what you get. So we had a lot of these women work with people from MIT to learn GIS mapping and create data and this and that and whatever else, and they were able to form it. Now, there always has to be short-term strategies to engage a community to get people involved, because if you just accept what the politicians are often giving us, we walk away from it. We challenged, and the television came, that after the ballot initiative failed, Ray Flynn, who was the mayor, who later became ambassador to the Vatican, he seemed to be somebody who really wanted to change the neighborhoods. But a lot of people, not only the developers leave all this debris, when cars die, they would bring them down to our neighborhood and leave them in front of the houses and this and that. And again, they were all there. So what our people did was they went down to Ray Flynn's campaign office, said, we want to work for you. We got 2,000 bumper stickers. We came back and we put them on the bumpers of all those cars that had been vacated. <laughs> and the media come out and Ray saw that he said, damn, these people are organized. <laughs> so he cited all the people. And then we got the city to come down and bring trucks and things and on the weekends we clean up all that debris. A lot of those vacant lots were owned by the city. And after we cleaned them up, at the end of the day, we'd have some barbecue and some music 
But we went to flower shops and got wild flowers, and we grew wild flowers. So where there was debris, th th then became beauty. And that's where the arts comes in. A beauty that people can see begins to raise the spirit in the heart to make people understand what can happen. We got eminent domain authority, the only nonprofit in the history of this country to this day. Ford gave us a $2 million program related investment to purchase 15 acres. The city gave us another 15 acres to go along with. And people told us they needed housing they could afford. And we went, found out what community land trust was all about. I later directed the Institute for Community Economics. But land trusts will provide home ownership to people with very low incomes, but the land is still owned by the nonprofit. Now, a lot of people will say, well, if you can't own the land, you're like, what, what the hell? If you're stabilizing their lives. Because with rental properties and whatever, it's, it's, it, it, it can be turned over. Once it reaches uh, its limit, it, 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 it goes out the door. But I think what you've got to understand, we also began looking at the school systems. And we took over. We saw we had a Jesuit priest come from New York. They had created a very fundamental school. But he said, no, I'll do it for you, but I'm not going to work with you. So we got rid of him. And we got some people. And we made our own charter schools, but not just because we believed in charter schools. We were able to take control of those schools, look at such things as what children need in the elementary school. We couldn't imagine why so many young people were coming home with scars on their, on their legs. Well, the schoolyard was made of cement. So we made people dig up all that cement and, 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 and put in uh, grass and, and sand. It's just little simple, basic things. We have to think about the children, not let things happen to them. We got many, Boston has more colleges and universities in any country, any city in, in the world. So we got them to help us with the curriculum, et cetera, whatever else. We raised the level of our schools and were able to get the best teachers in town to come and teach. Our young people started getting scholarships to Dartmouth, to Harvard, and whatever else. And they all went off to college. And what usually doesn't happen, they came back. In 2008, you remember when uh, things went south, the banks and everything. There were several stories written about Dudley Street that was the only inner city community in the country that did not have one foreclosure. <laughs> Recently, two years ago, the city bought, for those who might know that area up in Scorner, an old Bank of America building, a four-story commercial building, an old library, and they gave it to Dudley Street to include inside this land trust. What we also did is we created co-ops so that all the small businesses there could commonly purchase goods, goods that they each sold, so that they could compete with Kmart's and whatever else. And at the end of each year, based on what was left, we would give them some kind of a payout. We used to hold all kinds of theater to show how economics works and spirituality works. Because integrated approach to make things happen where all people can feel that we're raising a quality of life for them is something so good. It's sickening nowadays to look at the news the mental trauma that's going on, the synagogues, the second or third, that just, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I'm not supposed to get into the political arena, but I think some of what Trump is saying is spinning some of that, you know, and whatever else. And we've got to stand up. If we treat the immigrants bad, if we talk about the Muslims can't come here and this and that, then we can play everybody against each other based on his religion, et cetera, or whatever else. And so, the arts plays a very good role. You know, I, write, I, I always write notes for myself, but I forget to use it. And I'd probably be better off. But one of the things I want to say 
is, for example, Art Place America is a 10-year consortium of a number of foundations, federal agencies, and financial institutions that works to position arts and culture as a core sector of comprehensive community planning and development. It largely focuses efforts around creative placemaking, which describes project projects in which art plays an intentional and an integrated role in place-based community planning and development. This brings artists, arts organizations, and artistic activity into the suite of placemaking, strategies pioneered by Jane Jacobs and her colleagues, who believe that community development must be locally informed, human-centric, and holistic in practice. This means representing arts and culture alongside sectors like housing, transportation, public safety, and others. with each sector recognized as part of any healthy community, as requiring planning and investment from its community, and as having a respons responsibility to contribute to its community overall future. How many of y'all ever heard of Jane Jacobs? I got to know Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs challenged the great Bob Moses in New York when he started building things and destroying parts of New York. She was a brilliant woman. She was a psychologist. And some of us got to work with her through the Pratt Institute. In her later years, she moved back to Canada, where she was from, and she became blind. But if we had more Jane Jacobs helping with public policy, see, what I don't understand is that people who get elected to office, they bring public policy along with them that reflects that whom put them in office, often developers, et cetera, whatever else. Seattle, this is an amazing place. I do not understand why all the kind of development is going forward and whatever else, and our schools aren't doing more and things aren't getting better. I mean, I think just seeing this arts museum and, 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 and having them show us what was accomplished here, what people did, and what they had to go through to finance it, et cetera, or whatever else, is an amazing thing. The problem is that we, as individuals, don't get that much involved in community development anymore. How many of you all are involved in community development planning? At what level? What is community development? What I should say or planning in the first place. I learn something new every day by going into communities. I share with communities projects that I have been a part of in different parts of the country, what their successes are, what didn't work. But I don't come in claiming to know it. The wisdom of what communities need is in the minds of you, the people. I was on the advisory committee of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And Doug Frazier, who was head of the United Auto Workers at that time, we were having a discussion one day, and one of the mayors who thought he knew more than anybody was just speaking out, you know, big old fat cigar, you know, in them days they didn't, people still smoking. And Doug Frazier finally said, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. You're talking over my head. He said, you know, I'm a pretty intelligent person, but I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Doug Frazier tells a story about an airplane flying from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. In that plane was President Nixon, Vice President Agnew, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, a priest and a hippie. <laughs> the pilot said that when they got over Denver, that we're having engine trouble and we're going down and there are five of you and only four parachutes, so y'all should make a determination who should be saved. Well, Nixon said, I'm leader of the free world. I should be saved at all costs. He grabbed a parachute and jumped. Agnew said, well, you know, Tricky Dick is caught up in Watergate and I may have to replace him. Agnew forgot about his own <laughs> tax scam. He grabbed a parachute and jumped. Henry Kissinger said, I'm far and away the smartest man in the whole wide world. Middle East, shuttle diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera. I should be saved. He grabbed a parachute and jumped. The priest turns to the young hippie and says, young man, I'm 90 plus years old. I've lived my life. You take the final parachute. 
Hippie said, no follow me. Remember the man said he's the smartest man in the whole wide world? He said, yes. He grabbed my backpack. <laughs> so don't just listen to those who claim to know it all. There is more intelligence within you in these communities and whatever that we can share based on people who come from different parts of the world, et cetera, whatever else. We're hearing all this talk now about we're not going to allow immigrants in. They're coming in with drugs and whatever else. Immigrants are leaving their homes because our government is exploiting them. I was in Honduras with Danny Glover, the actor, good friend of mine, and some people earlier this year campaigning for a couple of Bolivian mayors in some of the major towns. And the fact that what our government is underwriting, one of the biggest military bases in that part of the country is an American base. We exploit these countries. I was called into El Salvador after Archbishop Romero was assassinated because I was with the World Peace Council and I was the mayor of Berkeley at the time. The FMLN invited me in. We went up into Charlottenango. We got bombed by American Mark planes. And we saw what AT&T and other American companies were doing to exploit them where they only have to pay one-tenth of one percent of the taxes for electricity and gas, where the people have to pay 100 percent. I saw the same thing when I worked in Puerto Rico for three years for the Department of Labor. We Americans don't really know enough about what our government is doing and practicing against us. And if we're going to get involved in making things better, then we've got to get involved in our own communities and get these young people involved because this is our future. These are our future. And I continue to work. I mean, I, I'll be here tomorrow. Next day, I go to Washington, D.C. to get a little reward. Then I got to go to Rochester, New York, <laughs> where I was born, because a, a DNA specialist is doing some stories on five black families going back to the 1700s. One of them is Newport family. So I have to tell stories about some of my people come from Canada and other places. The Underground Railroad went under there. Frederick Douglass was, was from Rochester, as was Susan B. Anthony. So all that history and stuff has to be analyzed, et cetera, or whatever else. And I think what's happening nowadays, television has grasped our visions. Most people have to work two or three jobs in order to just stay afloat. I remember working in Council Bluffs, Iowa, a few years ago, I was invited in to work with a poor, 97% poor white community to help them rebuild. And a lot of the young men had fought in the Korean War, the Vietnam War. When they came back, they were strung out on something. But there were a lot of vacant lots. The schools weren't doing that good. And so what I did is something that we call a wall of wonder. We found this in Dudley Street. Is we take a big sheet of paper in 10-year segments, 1950, 60, 60, 70. And we go across there and we ask people to remember those who can. Problems or good things that happened within those 10 year period, like a new bank came or a bank closed up, or a police shooting or something, or there used to be an ice cream parlor. Remember the days when there used to be ice cream parlors that the kids used to love to go to? Remember the days we didn't have to lock doors and whatever else and things like that? So during this time, I was telling the story about, and I remember a lot of us used to go to school, and we had poor, we had holes in our shoes, but we put cardboard at the bottom of our shoes. And it was, it was all right, except on, on, on rainy days. But this old couple was 90 years old, jumped up and said, I remember that. I remember those days. But those were the good old days. At least we planned and we talked about it, and everybody was there to help everybody. Out of that came what we call Christmas in April. That old family had a house that needed repair, fixing. We got the whole community to go, architects and everybody else, fix the wood on that house, build new stairs, painted a bright red color, and had celebrated it over a weekend. Doing things with and for one another. We can't wait on government, but that reflects the arts. To see something that's crumbling and falling down but painted with nice oranges and greens, et cetera, et cetera, whatever else, that provides a sense of spirituality, et cetera, et cetera, and whatever else. 
And I'll tell you, I will be going for the next 10 days from here to Washington, from Washington to Rochester, from there to Nashville. And in Nashville, I'm going there because the National Council of Elders, which was founded by Vincent Harding, who was Martin Luther King's speechwriter, who wrote the speech of time to break the silence against the Vietnam War. He founded an organization for people 65 and older in 2011 and decided that we're going to take what we learned in the Civil Rights Movement but create a bridge to young people who could learn what we did, what worked and what didn't. It's time to tell that while they help us with technology and with everything so that we can all become stronger and stronger and stronger. And I'm going to Haley Farm. Haley wrote a biography of Malcolm X. And I knew Malcolm X. I was traveling Malcolm four days before he was assassinated. And that's, that's a whole other story. But we're going there to work with young people, to give them the strategy they need. Because you know what? The truth is not really told in this country. History is not really recorded. And what I found out about a lot of black families, they don't care to tell what they endured so they don't pass that information on. I say that because my own grandmother, who took me to see Paul Robeson, took me to the Philharmonic, all these things, only told me after I was 26 in directing the number one civil rights group in Rochester, and when Malcolm X came to visit me, that her mother was a slave. Her mother was a slave that was blinded by the plantation boss. Her father was a Native American. And my grandmother, she had never told him about that story. So when my grandmother died, I told that story. And, it, and after the funeral, when everybody's going to break bread or whatever, my mother grabbed me and said, boy, before you go in there to eat with these people, you're going to tell me that story, because she never told me the story. <laughs> and when I told her, a smile came over her face. She said, now I understand why my mama always had a shotgun over the kitchen door and other kinds of things. But these stories need to be shared so people understand what has to, why we have to work collectively together. I mean, everybody in the United States of America is an immigrant except Native American. My people happen to be the only immigrants that came here in chains. And so let's stop this foolishness because we're supposed to be the most wealthiest country in the world right now. But look at the lifestyles in, in, in what some of us live, you know, et cetera, and whatever else. I keep going because I'm pleased that I was mentored by Malcolm X and Adam Clayton Powell, and Harry Belafonte, and Danny Glover and I are great friends. Danny Glover was a planner. He came out of San Francisco State with a degree in economics. He was in the, uh, the planning office in Berkeley for a while. We still got a piece of legislation written by him. You know, we can't just isolate ourselves and step back and not be participants. You know, the beloved community that Martin spoke about, love is, is is the defining factor. And how better do you translate that love than through the arts? But artists have to work together. They have to work collectively with the community. They have to be able to create public policy. I, coming out of a city like Berkeley, is supposed to be the most progressive city in the world. I come back now, and I'm called from time to time. The planning department right now is underwritten with fees from developers. Now that's gotta be illegal. I taught public policy to MIT. <laughs> the great city of Berkeley, I cannot believe this. But how are you all gonna find out what might be the best kinds of plans to provide the kinds of schools, the kinds of housing, the kinds of music, the kinds of love? And let me tell you one of the best tools. That Jerry Milhon runs thriving communities. He films every kind of thing that's being done. And I wouldn't dare say, you and the arts had better start filming stuff. 
to let people see what's happening or what isn't happening. And what is happening that is good is good for everybody to see. And remember, the arts consist of everything. I mean, I've been, like I say, I've been to revolutions in El Salvador, other places. Nothing plays a greater role in a revolution than music and poetry. I heard more poetry in Nicaragua and El Salvador during the revolution. I was on the committee on the question of Palestine's United Nations as well as against apartheid. Berkeley was the first city to divest from South Africa when I became mayor. I got to know Nelson Mandela. I escorted him around one day, but if you could hear the kinds of poetry, have you ever seen when Nelson Mandela came out of prison, whenever he'd be on a program sometimes like that cute little dance he used to do? <laughs> All that stuff, the spirituality of it, whatever else. You know, I, uh, um, Matthew, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to apologize because I haven't really looked at my notes and I'm, I'm, I, may, I may be off key, but you can, you, you can get me with the questions if you want the specifics you want me to get to or whatever. Or if you want, I'll go back and read this. Uh, <laughs> but love is a, is, is a defining factor of building communities. Understand that. We are people who have come to always challenging one another, this ethnic group or that ethnic group or that lifestyle or whatever else. I go back off and I think about what it was that allowed politics to be so good. I was on a, I don't know how many of you all know a Holly Near, who, who did Singer. I was, the, I was the first man on Holly Near's board, Redwood Records. A Holly and I both spoke at, 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 at uh, UC Berkeley one night when uh, Bishop Tutu was there. She sang, and I spoke, and Holly said to me after, she said, come on, Gus, let's go get a drink. She said, I'm having trouble right now with what she calls the guerrilla feminist. And I see you get along with everybody, left, right, whatever. I want to know how to do that. And we went out together for a long time. Jane Fonda who got Holly into film, did a fundraiser for me when I ran for office the first time. You talk about somebody who has a background for the arts or whatever else, Jane Fonda is now 82 years old. You don't hear her name, but I can tell you she's doing a whole lot of funding and stuff with a group I'm involved with in, 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 in Georgia, and et cetera, whatever else. You gotta reach out to these people. You gotta find these things. You gotta be able to translate what you're doing. I mean, Jerry does the thriving communities every March and other kinds of things. I don't know how he keeps going, but I wish some of you all would get to know him more in, in whatever else. Uh, there's Brad with the uh, Association of Beloved Communities. That's our administrator. Music is such a great thing, the arts. We all we aspire to is peace and love. And I think what I'm going to do is let y'all ask me some questions, because maybe then I can give you some specific answers. I probably haven't done that so far. Yes, sir. Speak loud. I forgot to bring my hearing aid today. Yeah. 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 Um, as I said, it's on the, 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 the laws of Massachusetts that if a nonprofit can create a master plan that suffices what the city planning department and redevelopment agency wants, they can get eminent domain authority. What we had to do was, you know, we raised money, we got all the nonprofits to begin to look to work together because nonprofits have a tendency to work individually. And that's, that hurts in a lot of communities. Once that master plan was put together, what did that mean? What kind of housing we wanted? Most of it was community land trust or co-op housing that would serve people most in need. We wanted to create parks. We wanted beauty. We wanted to help the small business. We wanted to raise the capacity of our schools, et cetera, or whatever else. 
And lo and behold, when that, it took a couple of years, but when we submitted that plan, we were given eminent domain authority. So there were 30 acres of vacant land. The city owned 15 acres. In, in order to purchase the other 15 acres, we had been a deal with a, an insurance company in Canada that was going to give us a letter of credit, but that company went under. So then the city decided that we were doing such a good job, they committed us their 15 acres. They had taken some tax arrears. We used that as collateral to get a $2 million program-related investment from Ford Foundation at 1% to purchase that land. And we only took it partially at times as we were going to develop so we wouldn't have to be paying insurance and things like that. You've got to learn. I mean, another thing that happened, we challenged the banks with redlining during that time. That was when the Community Reinvestment Act passed. And the bank said, we'll never admit it, but we'll sit down and talk with you. Well, part of the CRA Community Reinvestment Act said that if banks want to merge, they got to get cities to support it. So we met with them for 18 months. Steve Coyle, head of the redevelopment agency, got Northwestern to do a study that proved 30 years of redlining. Eventually, the banks came around and decided to create a small business Community Development Corporation as well as the Affordable Housing Community Development Corporation. Each bank had to put up between a half million and a million dollars in that. They put 50% community people on the boards of both of those CDCs. I was on both of them. They wanted me to become the CEO of the small business. I said, I ain't got no banking background. I give away all that money. But, uh, <laughs> but it's things like this we've got to learn and we've got to do. We just can't take for granted that the banking industry is going to do right or who, even in government, is in bed with somebody or whatever else, we got to have that total analysis. I'll say things to some people, sometimes people say, oh, no, you're all wrong. How the hell do they know? They ain't never been involved in the depths of some of this stuff that I and others have. And like I say, I don't know at all. I learn something new every day. But it's getting those details. I mean, you ask what I call the right question. So you must have some ideas of some of the problems that are existing right now. We've got to then together, work together, to get to the bottom of that. And again, I mean, like I say, I, I'm up here quite often with the Association of Beloved Communities, and we're going to be working with communities and neighborhoods and whatever else, and we'd like to collectively make, take advantage of some of this stuff and definitely bring the arts into this and everything else. It's got to be done with love, but it's got to be done consistently, and you've got to work at it. You can't just, oh, I'll do something here today or something tomorrow. It's got to be consistent because you've got to be concerned about the future of our children. Yes, yes, ma'am. You. Oh, yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Jessica Ramirez. I'm the director of community engagement at Puget Sound Stage. We're a policy and advocacy organization with an equitable development program. Um, previously, uh, being at SAGE, I had the honor of organizing with farm workers in the Skagit Valley, about 500 Oaxacan indigenous farmers who were picking for <coughs> Driscoll berries, and waged one of the largest boycotts against Driscoll to unionize their farm, which they did about three years ago. And something that I learned from these indigenous Oaxacan workers, farmers, was that when you don't have land, you have nothing. So they had nothing to lose in going against the largest berry company in the world. And when they won, they decided, well, that wasn't the win, what's next? And now they are farming on a cooperative farm that they have um, built. And this is their second year. If you're ever in Bellingham, please look out for their berries. It's called Cooperativa Tierra de, Le de Libertad. Um, and also, I think in the rural areas, it's a lot easier to really focus on what's right in front of you, which right. is just like, how do you get this land that's right, right here? When you're a farmer, you're just like, this is the land that I'm on. I, 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 I did something like that in Puerto Rico and Ponce, the second largest city. Mm -hmm. And so you're just like, so, you've got your goal right in front of you. Right. But in the urban center, but, you have right, no, right. But you've got to work together because in each community, each neighborhood, they've got to know what those things are. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we've got to look at basic things that are happening because each community has schools. 
as I say, they cut out the arts in schools, they cut out sports. Those were things that kept a lot of young people going. I mean, Jerry, what game was that your granddaughter played it today? Lacrosse. lacrosse. She played two lacrosse games today. And she's here. Stand up. She played two. So my question is, is when you have so many distractions around you, I know there's not a silver bullet, but I'm curious in all of the experience that you have learning from across, around the, around the world, what is it that you see is kind of the, the thread that keeps people Well, well I think, I, I, I think that's different. why people have to come together and talk. And you have to identify short-term problems as well as long-term. That's what organizing is all about. And although you say distractions, them distractions ain't making things no better. Look at what people, the general people need to make this a better life and go off that. That's what public policy should come from. Because if it's coming from something else, then it just perpetuates the status quo of the conditions that we got now. And that's what it's all about. That's what happened in the good old days called the town hall meeting days, et cetera, whatever else. Old things that work ain't bad. I don't care how much education you got. Because like I say, at MIT, when I was teaching a class on public policy, et cetera, whatever else, when we got to know things, we did community benefits agreements and things like that so communities could benefit from this and that. It came from what the community needs. You've got to do that. You've got to have that data. You can't just, from up here somewhere, suggest from an educated standpoint you can do so without having the data and the analysis why the conditions that exist are what they are. That's baseline, and that's our problem. We're jumping over that. We, just, we focus on a few things that somebody directs us to. That ain't going to get nothing changed. I hope I answered your question. Thank you again for coming. Um, I have a question along the lines of uh, one of the things I've noticed with working with a lot of partners and working with a lot of uh, nonprofits and CEOs, community-based organizations, is when you dangle money in front of them, it becomes cut. That's becomes, right. You know, every, you hit each one of the biggest people. problems in our cities all across this country. So that scarcity mindset is really strong in this kind of work. And I just I want to pick your brain a little bit on how have you been able to break through that and really build strong partnerships with other organizations? Well, one of the things we did, we talked about having a social services master plan when we started planning for Dudley Street. And the foundation world thought that was the greatest thing that could happen. <coughs> now, the nonprofits didn't want it because nonprofits have a tendency to develop their purpose and mission based on something, and they continue to follow that year after year without having the data analysis, what's been corrected, what's changed, what we have changed. And a lot of them oppose the social services master plan. What the foundations did though, they came to me, they said, well look, if they won't join, every time we get a proposal for them, if it's not coordinated with your plan, the hell with them. Then they started. Yeah. The thing. So, you know, you got to go out. We can't just have because we got a nonprofit here and a nonprofit there doing their thing. If they're doing the right kind of thing, let's work with them and let's help make it happen. But nonprofits often move in from somewhere else, often run by an individual, this and that, think they know economic analysis and stuff better than anybody else. Your question's a good one. It's one we got to study. I'm not against nonprofits. Don't misunderstand me. A great part of my life has been in the nonprofit community. But let's make them work for the good of our community. Yes, sir. Hey, brother. Welcome back, Tom. All right. Uh, your spirit blessed us to get the uh, SBI and the OIC state legislation that is turning back to the community. But we're still having uh, problems with the uh, city buildings, like you said, that you can't just create something and spot it because we created all those. In 70, when we had the federal model city study, they put them up on the city, and the city sort of tied it, you know, paying for them now, and they're going something else. So uh, I, I, I agree with you that we went to sleep on them. So we 
Well, you're going to need a couple of things. You're going to need my spirit, but you're going to need an organization like hers, too, yeah. with the capacity to help you with the data and the analysis. You're going to have to have thinking. You're going to have to film some of this stuff like Jerry shows, because film will show you what's all working for the good of the community and what is it and stuff like that. You're going to have to do all those kinds of things. It doesn't happen overnight. These problems didn't happen yesterday. They won't be corrected tomorrow. But hopefully, as we begin to correct them, it raises the spirit and it means a better future for our next generation. But I, I agree with you. We've got to get to that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, Vivian, I'm, I'm with my bus so far. Um, I recently had an idea that I thought was smart. Um, and it was we have a lot of libraries in cities that are one story or two story. and the idea of building up from government buildings to turn them into more public usable space. Um, I was wondering if you've come across models like that, and because I've only heard of one example that failed terribly, apparently. Uh, yeah, one of the things we did in our master plan in Dudley Street was to have height limitations, but within a city like Seattle or whatever, you got to take advantage of that which is going to be of benefit to you, and if uh, the policy doesn't reflect it or it's such a now, then you have to talk about why you want to raise it and what good that's going to be. You've got to change some of those conditions from time to time. And I think, but you have to have plan to say what we're going to do with that, who's going to help, et cetera, how it's going to bring a better economy and some better kinds of programs, et cetera, as a community, whatever else. You can't just say it for the sake of saying it. But I would imagine a sharp young lady like you already has a real idea what may happen if that's allowed to happen. Matter of fact, you could probably give a lecture on it right now. Let's <laughs> take one more. Hello, sir. Hi. My name is Lisa. I'm a local artist, and I work with the storytelling organization. And we would like to know how we can best network. Do you know anybody? Can I have some emails to send my revolutionary poems, songs, and stories? Do I need to be on the street with my mobile theater? How do you best see us moving forward to connect with other organizations? Let me say, I praise storytelling. It's one of the greatest organizing tools there is. I can't speak to who you should be involved with right here in Seattle, but I will turn that over to Jerry and some other people that have answers there. But storytelling is one of the greatest things that happen. Storytelling attracts people. It brings them along. It makes them recognize that there's some of the kinds of things that we believe in and love is happening. I absolutely, and, and, and so, I mean, I'm back and forth. I'd like to sit down with you and find out with some of these other things. Storytelling is great. Don't stop it. We're going to make you a star. Yeah. <laughs>